Good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you've chosen to worship at Greens Farms Church this morning. We continue our mini series on our need for rest and renewal and recognize that a Sabbath rest can help us in our faith and in our daily lives. For we know that what the prophet Isaiah tells us is true, that even the youth grow tired and weary, but when we place our hope in God, our strength is renewed and we will soar on wings like eagles. So as we prepare our hearts for what the spirit will say to us this morning, let us continue our worship as our director of children's ministries, Lucretia Gill, leads us in our time of prayer. Let us pray. God, we thank you for a new day and for this time where we look to a new season of fellowship with you. We thank you for all that you've brought us through. Your faithfulness teaches us to have confidence in you no matter what comes our way. Help us to lean on you in all times and guide us through every change and transition. We ask these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for reminding us that there, in the good old days, we used to actually be in the room with an organ and a piano and instruments of praise, and, and that maybe someday we will resume that custom in company in the meeting house. Uh, good morning, friends. And it has been a joy to walk these weeks and months with you. And, and Jeff asked me this morning to reflect on my experience of Sabbath and what it has to do with rest and what it has to do with well-being. So I want to begin by taking you to a breakfast that happened in the year 2007 in Seattle, Washington. I was a 45-year-old senior minister at a downtown church in Seattle, and I was having breakfast with a 75-year-old minister at a university church in North Seattle, and he looked a whole lot better than I did. We were eating at the Washington Athletic Club. We we're having this breakfast. He had just finished his workout, now 75 years old. He had just finished his workout and a quick sauna and a shower and had greeted me at the table. And I practically slumped into my chair because I was working 80-hour weeks at this, uh, at this relatively new job as a senior minister, and I was tapped out. He looked 
fresh as a daisy. And so we did the usual pleasantries and we, we uh, you know, how's your week going, all those things. And then finally I, I gasped, Earl, how do you do it? You're, you're, you're practically 75 years old and you, you write books and you pastor a large church and you give these great sermons and you have a robust family life. And, the, and I went on and on and I said, how do, you, how do you do that? I feel like I can't make it past 46. And he, he paused for a long time just to slow down my role. And he looked me in the eye and he said, Alan, it has to do with Sabbath. And now for me, as for most ministers, a day off is a joke, right? We, we have this little inside humble brag. Yeah, I'd love to take a day off, but my people need me too much. So I, I'll just keep going. And, and then the day off, of course, can't be Sunday, which is a lot of people's Sabbath, because we work a little bit on Sundays. And, and so we try, to, we try to shoehorn out a day off, or at least part of a day off on another day of the week. Some people do Monday, some people do Thursday, it depends on rhythm, but most of us uh, sort of uniformly uh, lack success in that area. And Earl said it has to do with Sabbath. Right. Now, he reminded me that when that command in Exodus 20, that command from Sinai came, you know, that, uh, uh, you shall have no other gods before me, you shall have no graven images, right in the middle of the commands comes, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, right? For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day shall be a Sabbath unto the Lord. And, and he reminded me that when Moses spoke those words, having come down Sinai with the tablets, the Israelite people had been 20 generations, 400 years in slavery. Now, slavery is not a setting in which anyone gets a day off. Slavery is a setting in which I am at the behest of, of the person who is my or overlord. And so for 400 years, the Israelite people have not had a day off, not had a that they governed themselves. So as they stood at the base of Mount Sinai, every command was important. Don't get me wrong. Every one of the thou shalt nots, every one of the thou shalt was important. But the only one that I can imagine getting a cheer, the only one that I can imagine hearing a gasp of joy about is this one. 400 years, 20 generations without a day off. And suddenly God says, not only do we get one, but we get one once a week. Take a day off, says the Almighty. In fact, do it next week and the week after and the week after. Earl reminded me that Sabbath is a gift. It's not an, alter it's not an option that we try to squeeze in. And maybe you have this tension in yourself, this product productivity uh, sort of built in you, this, this type A, this got to get the next thing done, this sort of humble brag, I'm sorry, I don't have time to take a day off, right? Maybe you have that built in you. It's not a bad idea to go every once in a while back to the foot of Mount Sinai and put our, ourselves in the place of those ancient Israelites, because you and I make our own enslavement. You and I are the people who make our lives so busy that we can't replenish, that we can't rest because we just have too much to do. Now, in the years between when Moses came down that mountain and gave that command, and when Jesus showed up famously challenging the Pharisees in his daily walk in Galilee, in the years between that, Israel, like us, kind of lost sight of what Sabbath was. Some people just stopped thinking it was important. And so they may be inclined by social pressure, and they may have been into close-knit communities that were almost obliged to do Sabbath, but they started to think of it as an obligation rather than as a gift. And, and indeed, the Pharisees whom Jesus encounters uh, continue a long condition, uh, a long, long tradition of policing Sabbath. People who would go around and literally enforce Sabbath 
if, if someone was doing more than this, the police thought they should do, the Sabbath police would step in and hound them and, and make shameful, so make them, make them ashamed of what they were doing, right? And so Jesus is healing people, and, and the Pharisees jump out and stop him and say, I'm sorry, you can't do that on the Sabbath. And in a famous scene, just before one of those healings on Sabbath, Jesus and his disciples in Mark chapter 2 are walking along in a wheat field, and they've been walking quite a while. And so the, the disciples start to pick little heads of grain because it's a part of their good day to pick little heads of grain and have a little food because they're hungry. Well, in this comical scene, this, the Pharisees, who were, who were not to be uh, noticed beforehand, jump out from behind the wheat stalks and say, aha, we caught you. We caught you picking grain. And God says, you can't do that. And so they give them that shame, that scarlet letter of violating Sabbath. And Jesus pauses like Earl did with me. Jesus pauses in the face of these Pharisees and probably shakes his hand and head and holds his hand on his forehead and says, guys, sorry, but you've got this all wrong. Did you ever notice that humanity wasn't made for the Sabbath? Sabbath happened after the six days of creation. Humanity wasn't made for the Sabbath. Human beings were created on the sixth day, the last of God's glorious creation. Humanity wasn't created for the Sabbath. It's the other way around. Sabbath was made for humanity. You see, years and years had passed, and they had lost the notion that God was giving them a gift in Sabbath. It felt like an obligation. It felt like something they had to shoehorn out of their schedule. It felt burdensome. Jesus needed to come in and turn the tables and say, it's the other way around. God made this for you. God said, take a day off. God said, grow your life. God said, thrive. So take a day off. But let it be a generative day, not a day of hair shirts and obligation. Let it be a generative day of joy where you can say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Fast forward. Earl Palmer had told me this way back when I was a minister in Seattle. But the time came in 2013 for me to get a sabbatical. Now, I noticed this morning that Dave was absent Right, Dave Stanbaugh is on his sabbatical, and it's a little bit of a loss for us in a lot of different ways because because he's our MC, he's our he's our uh, he's our kind of fluid transition from getting online to being in worship, and we miss him for pointing out little uh, foibles we have and recognizing us as we get on the screen. But Dave is properly doing Tai Chi in the upstairs of his house because he's on sabbatical. My time came in 2013. You see, when I was an academic, they gave me a, a sabbatical, but I, in my, in my wisdom, chose not to use it. I, I started doing ministry full-time in another place while I was on sabbatical from Yale, and, and so I, I was wrung out at the end of it, came back, and, and tried to regain my strength while I was in my job. 2013, I got one of these Lilly fellowships that that your man, Jeff Ryder, has, has had, and they are blessed. These people tell you, if you do any work, we're taking our money back, right? They don't want us to work. And so, so I was charged with figuring out what is this supposed to look like, and my mind went back to Earl Palmer. Because at that breakfast table, he said something revolutionary. He said, Sabbath is not simply trying to eke out, to shoehorn out a little space in your schedule and breathe a deep breath and, and just collapse. He said, Sabbath is developing a rhythm of life in which every seven-day unit has all you need to thrive. Every seven-day unit, every week, has in it everything you need to thrive spiritually, physically, emotionally, intellectually. Every week, has refills of all those chambers of our lives. He said, Sabbath 
is living in a seven-day rhythm with God. It was brilliant. And so I designed my sabbatical in 2013. I said, I still haven't heeded what he told me way back when I was a 45-year-old tapped out minister, right? So I'm going to do it right this time. And I I set up a sabbatical that would fill all those chambers, those spiritual, emotional, physical, intellectual. I got to be an exercising physical self. I got to be a praying spiritual self. I got to be with my family and recharge emotionally, and I got to read good books and see great things in Oxford and London that charged me intellectually. It was remarkable. And the idea was to come back and do what you and I could do any day, any week. The idea was to let that sabbatical inform the way I live going forward. And that's what I have for you this morning. Sabbath is not simply taking that blessed day off that God offered the Israelites back on the foot of Mount Sinai. Sabbath is a life that God fills in seven-day units. Sabbath is never getting through the seven-day unit of a week without somehow letting God fill us in all the areas that make for thriving. Friends, human beings were not created for Sabbath. Sabbath was created for us. So take a day off, live a week well, have a Sabbath and cheer about it with those Israelites. Have a Sabbath and rejoice in it like Jesus and his disciples. Have a Sabbath. Because you know what Earl Palmer is doing today? He's pushing 90 and he's doing blessed ministry and he's living life in thriving seven-day units. How about you and I do that too? Amen? Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. We do rejoice. We are glad for it. We are glad for our friend, Alan Hilton. Uh, Thank you once again, Alan, for being part of uh, our worship uh, all these many, many months. Um, We want to also encourage all of you and thank you for joining us. And for those of you who are going to be participating in small groups, we want you to stay right where you are. Those conversations are just about to begin. Everyone else, we will see you back here tomorrow or I should say on next Sunday at 9 a.m. And for those of you who are able, at 10.30 for worship outdoors at Earth Place. 
including outdoor ministry for children, um, preschool through grade eight. Until then, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Amen and amen.